Is this good? Is that clear? It's, a, it's impossible. More about yeah? <laughs> Every time I learn more. <laughs> So when I, when is it going to be this? Um we'll start on Monday, and we'll have it in the afternoon after the lectures, before the dinner, almost every day of the for two weeks. two weeks. I see. Yeah, we have thirty something people already signed up. How much time will you give to every student? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Last question. How generous. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is so many of us. Right. Is it going to be blackboard also? Oh. Ah. Well, we but anyone who wants to use it. So, yeah, I think we're going to start. So, so if you. If you want to learn about Melin amplitudes, you should come. Yeah, what is your name? Arash. Nice. Where are you from? Sorry? Iran. Iran. So you always eat this Persian food, the, b yeah. the best food in C4C? I love it. If, they, if everybody is in here. Yeah, so as people are getting in, I wanted to make a quick announcement about the student talk. You probably know we are starting on Monday. We'll have the talks in the afternoon before the dinner. Maybe some downside to it, but nice thing is we'll get to chat with the students the next. And there are, as of right now, six empty slots. <coughs> so if you repeat the email, please go sign up in the Google sheet. If not, please come talk to Pedro, Nima, or me. We'll write your name. Thank you. Okay, so so in this last lecture, I just want to conclude the, this discussion that we were having about uh, finite temperature, and then uh, I I changed my plan because I realized that really most of you already know all of these basic things about ADS CFT. So today I will talk about Mellin amplitudes, which I think will be probably more interesting for you. So, but before that, I will just uh, conclude this discussion of CFTs at finite temperature. So we already discussed last time that just by uh, dimensional analysis, the entropy density must be proportional to the temperature. So, so here I'm doing the case where I have flat space times the time circle, okay, with some period beta equal to the inverse temperature. So the only scale you have available is the temperature, and so the entropy density has to be proportional to temperature to the d minus 1, with some coefficient, which again, you can think of this coefficient as some uh, measure so of the number of uh, degrees of freedom on your theory. Okay? Again, I don't want to say that this is a, a measure in the sense that it always, a quantity that always decreases and our RG flow, that is not true. But physically, it's clear that if you have a higher entropy density, you have more degrees of freedom. Okay? So it's a good measure just in, in that sense. So, and we saw that if we start to put a gas of particles in ADS, um, we get the wrong scaling, right? So that does not give the, the correct scaling for, um, 
for a CFT in the dimensions. So what we need to do is now to put gravity, and the actual gravity dual of this is going to be a black hole. And in fact, since we are taking this flat geometry, it's going to be a, a black brain, like uh, Simon was mentioning. And so the metric can be written as Well, here, um, this i and j is just the, the spatial directions of your, uh, of your uh, so d mi d minus, this r d minus 1, where this f of z is just 1 minus, uh, we can write it as z, z age over z to the power d, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay, so as you can see, this is a black brain uh, uh, geometry. So when z is equal to z age, you have an horizon. And uh, now you can compute the entropy density just by measuring the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of this uh, horizon, okay? Just the area of this horizon. But okay, before doing that, you have to relate it. Maybe I can continue here. Let's keep to the rules of blackboard use. So, so regularity of that geometry implies that you have to fix this uh, uh, periods of the time coordinate. So you should this do this exercise and show that this Euclidean geometry, it's only regular, so it doesn't have a conical defect when z uh, is equal to ZH that around that point, if you choose the period of this uh, uh, Euclidean time circle to be given by 4 pi ZH over D, okay? <coughs> so, so this, of course, is just 1 over the temperature, the period of your time circle. And now, of course, you can compute the, the entropy of your black hole. So this is just the area over 4g, g newton, which if you go back to my notations, you should write like as 4 pi over L Planck to the d minus 1 times the area. So what is the area? Well, we just look here. It's r over zh to the d minus 1 times the area along the, I mean, just the volume of the flat direction, the, this flat space. So the entropy density, so you get that the entropy density is some, well, I can write it, but okay, 4 pi. So you just replace here what you get. Uh, essentially, you get t to the d minus 1 with some specific factor here, right? So whatever, you have to replace it. ZH, 1 over ZH is 4 pi over D to the D minus 1. And uh, of course you get this R over L Planck to the D minus 1. Okay? So I should write it like that. T to the D minus 1. Okay? Okay, so first conclusion is that you get the right scaling. And second comment is that you get a specific value for this constant Cs, which in particular, it's very large in the semi-classical limit. So it also scales with this parameter that we were relating with n square. So in particular, if you take, uh, if you take the ratio Cs over Ct, this is given by some function so some universal function that only depends on the space-time dimension, right? So this is what gravity tells you. And so, okay, so what, what's the physical meaning of this, of this equation? The physical meaning is very simple. So CT measures the two-point function of the stress tensor, okay? So measure just uh, 
G Newton directly from the action by just graviton propagation. Okay? While CS measures the entropy of black holes, okay? the high energy density of states. So it measures G Newton coming from the formula, the Beckenstein Hawking formula. Okay? So the fact that this formula is universal is just the fact that if you know that you have a gravity theory with some G Newton that you can measure by just graviton scattering at low energies, given that you know G Newton, you already know that the high energy density of states is controlled by the same number. Okay? So gravity has this interesting fact that if you know some low energy data, you immediately also learn something about the very high energy density of states. So, of course, if you take a given any CFT, this is not true. Okay? So this is not universal in a generic CFT. So one natural conjecture would be to say, if I assume that I have large N, so some CFT with large N and with large gap, this delta gap that I was discussing yesterday, can you prove that these two conditions imply this universal ratio? Okay? So this would be another natural conjecture like I was discussing yesterday. I should, I should make two comments. So one comment is that in, uh, in D equals 2, this is automatic. You don't need any constraint. Any CFT in D equals 2 will just satisfy this universal ratio immediately because both these numbers are just uh, the central charge up to some number, okay? the central charge of the 2D CFT. And uh, the other comment is that if you look in, uh, in super young mills, in super young mills, this ratio works if you go to strong coupling. Okay? So when you go to lambda to infinity, so as it should, because then you have a large gap, so it should work. But it does not work at weak coupling, but fails just by a factor of three quarters, okay? the famous factor of three quarters for those of new remember some of this history. Okay. okay, for the ones who don't is that f in the early days of uh, ADS-CFT, people were computing this at weak at strong coupling, and they found this mismatch by three quarters. And at that time, at least for some people, it's not completely obvious that things could change with the coupling. They were, some quantities were matching on the nose, some were depending on the coupling. And if something looks almost the same, it only fails by three quarters. You got to get a bit confused. Maybe you are just doing a mistake or something. But now it's clear that it's just evolved with the coupling, but it varies very little, this ratio in super young mills from weak to strong coupling. Okay. Any question about this? Yes. Einstein gravity, exactly. Higher curvature corrections will change this, exactly. Yes, so that's precisely the same idea that this gap should be suppressing the size of higher curvature correction. Any other question? Okay. okay. So Mellin amplitudes. What are Mellin amplitudes? So these are just uh, a particular way, a particular representation of conformal correlation functions. Okay. So I'll just write. Now you all you already know this embedding notation. So I'll just use it. So let me take scalar primary operators. Let me take this endpoint function, and I'll write it in the following form. I'll write it as some integral. I'll explain. And then m of these variables OK. So let me explain this formula. So this is the formula. It's just an integral representation, and this function m is the what I will call the Mellin amplitude. So what am I writing here? So you have this dependence on the positions of the insertions of the operators, 
And all of that dependence is put here. So remember that this is just the distance square if you go to the Poincaré patch, for example. Okay? So this, of course, only depends on the distances between the points. It's a Poincaré invariant uh, correlation function. So there you are. And you just raise that to some powers, and you integrate over these powers. Okay? So the gamma functions are just there for convenience. You will see later that they, they make some things uh, more simpler. So what else should I say? So clearly, we need to impose an extra constraint. Can anyone tell me about that? <laughs> what, what, is not, uh, what symmetry of this correlation function is still not automatic in this formula? Scaling, right? So each one of these operators is an homogeneous function of uh, the point uh, of scaling of this uh, embedding point P. So we have to impose that. So let's, let's do that. So if we scale P i, we just get uh, a power there, which is gamma i j summed over all j from 1 to n for j different from i, right? And this must be equal to delta i. If we impose all these n constraints, then everything is automatic. Okay? So this integral is over this constraint surface. <coughs> okay, so I will use a convenient notation. So I will define this delta i to be minus gamma i i. Okay, so this diagonal gamma uh, variable doesn't appear in the integral, so I can call it what, whatever I want. So I'll just define it to be that, such that now the constraint is just a sum equal to zero without the difference. Okay? So this is just a trivial trick. And of course, I'm assuming, I'm thinking about gamma ij as a symmetric, symmetric matrix. Yes. M is the Mellin amplitude. Okay? It's, think of it as a Fourier transform. Right? You have some function of x, and now you have some function of these gammas. Just some integral transform. <coughs> OK, what else should I, should I say? So for example, for two and three point functions, this should make sense. Okay? So this should, at least in those cases where this is trivial, this should work. And actually, if you come here, um, so, sorry. So, so we have these n constraints. So how many integration variables, how many free variables do you have? So the number of independent gamma ij's is n, n minus 1 over 2 minus n constraints. So it's n, n minus 3 over 2, okay? Which, if you remember, is also the number of uh, cross ratios in an endpoint function. Okay? So we're good. We have one integral per cross ratio. And in particular, for two and three point functions, there's no integration variable. So this formula just gives you what, you, what it should. Just gives you the form of two and three point functions in conformal, conformal invariant structure. There's no integral to do. OK, so n equals 4. The four point function is the first time you have to do an integral. So let, let me explain the integral, and in particular, the integration contour in that case. Okay? So let's do this example of n equals 4. And let's take all operators to be the same. Okay? So delta i, uh, they are all the same, equal to delta. So in this case, you can just solve this uh, n constraints very easily. And basically, what the constraints tell you So these constraints tell you that gamma 1, 2 is gamma 3, 4. Gamma 1, 3 is gamma 2, 4. Gamma 1, 4 is gamma 2, 3. And the last constraint, you can think of it as gamma 1, 3 plus gamma. OK, let's make it order 1, 2, 1, 3 plus gamma 1, 4 equals delta. Yeah? That's actually one of the, it's the first constraint directly from there. OK, so then let me write the integral very explicitly. <coughs> so this four-point function uh, 
will be given by. So I will use as independent variables, so let me leave here some space, gamma 1, 2, and gamma 1, 4, and it's... Okay. So, so m will be a function of the independent variables. After I solve the constraint, I have two variables get from those formulas. And now I, I have the gamma functions, which form squares in this case. So I solve for gamma 1, 3, delta minus gamma 1, 2 minus gamma 1, 4. Unfortunately, okay. And what happens to the space uh, dependence, right? The most important part. What happens to it? So once you solve the six gammas that you had here, the six variables, in terms of the two independent ones, they natural, naturally organize in cross ratios, okay? So, so basically, you just left out here with minus two P1 dot P3 to the delta, and sorry. Let me introduce, otherwise I'll be writing this all the time. So let me define pij to be minus two pi dot pj, okay? So this is p13, p24 to the delta. And, uh, and the rest of the dependence, I don't have space here, sorry, so I'll write it here. You just get u to the minus gamma 1, 2, and v to the minus gamma 1, 4, where, well, maybe you still don't remember, I'll write it here. So this is p13, p14, p12, p34, and v, the other cross ratio is P14, P23, P12, P34. Sorry, P13, P24. Okay, so it, it's a very simple, if, if, if anyone is confused with this step, please ask me. Okay, good. But now I have to explain this integration contour. So what is this integration contour? So let me look in this complex plane, for example, of the variable gamma 1, 2, okay? So some functions, for example, the gamma functions immediately give you some singularities, okay? So in this case, I'll have double poles at the negative integers, 0, minus 1, minus 2. And then you have this other gamma function, for example, that also gives you poles in gamma 1, 2, but now, well, I'll just write generically here. So the first pool, let's say, it's at position delta minus gamma 1, 4, and then plus integers, okay? So, of course, the gamma functions always give you a semi-infinite sequence of poles, okay? And the claim is that the Mellin amplitude will also give you the same type of poles. I will argue for that afterwards. But so, so the, the prescription for the contour is that the contour runs parallel to the imaginary axis, separating this infinite, semi-infinite sequence of poles, okay? If you have a semi-infinite sequence to the right, you pass to the left of the first pole of that, and vice versa, okay? So I'll just write here minus i infinity to i infinity, but depending on the specific case, you might have to shift and turn around to always satisfy this property that you separate the sequences from one to one side and the other. Okay? Any question? Can you repeat? The reason is this standard definition of the cross ratios. Because one, two appears here and one, four appears here. So it, it looks nicer. Otherwise, I would get like u over v and uh, just that. So you can, you can pick any two, and you always get cross ratios, but it can be different than the standard one. OK. So what should I say now? Cro comments. So first comment is, 
So crossing symmetry, right? So permutation symmetry of this uh, original correlation function. When you write it in the Malian language, it's just uh, permutation of this variable. So in particular, for example, here, let's, let's analyze this case. So instead of thinking of this function as a function of two variables, you can think of this function as a function of three variables with a constraint. Right? This is like s, t, and u of scattering amplitudes with this constraint here. right? And now it's just uh, like crossing symmetry is just permutation invariance. Okay? So this would be crossing symmetry is the function must be invariant under this. So this is, if you want, the first the first uh, sign that this is this is very similar to a uh, scattering amplitude, okay, at least formally, because the realization of crossing symmetry now is this permutation symmetry between, say, S, T, and U, these three variables that are like Mandel's time invariant. Okay, but okay, this is very weak argument, so. Let me continue to make this analogy with scattering amplitudes something more manifest. But, um, but actually, before giving you a real physical reason, I still have to, I want to continue with these weak arguments for one more minute. So I will do something very uh, artificial. So I'll introduce. I'll introduce uh, momenta. Okay, let me some fictitious momenta, one for each particle. And I'm actually a bit afraid of this, but if I maybe I should call it k, but then I might be confused. But okay, ki one for each particle. Okay, and I introduce this momenta, and I impose such that uh, their inner product, ki dot kj, is given by this Malian variables, gamma ij variable. Okay? So in particular, there is uh, an on-shell condition. So ki square is minus delta i, right? because I, I define ga gamma ij diagonal like that. So if I do that, then uh, momentum conservation, sorry, sum of ki i from 1 to n equals 0, okay? I introduce this momenta as conserved, implies the, the constraints on the gamma ij's. Right? So it's automatic, this constraint. So I can, I will think that actually these gamma ij's are really just the inner products of some momenta, which uh, I haven't defined. I only know their inner products. But you will see that thinking of these gamma ij's as inner products of momenta is very useful. Okay? I will convince you of that in the next minutes. Yeah, so in particular, for the, for the n equals 4, for the 4-point function, this leads naturally to the introduction of uh, Mandel's time invariance. So, for example, I can introduce a, a variable s, which is minus k1 plus k2 squared, which, of course, I have to expand. And if I expand, I just get delta 1 plus delta 2 minus 2 gamma 1, 2. Okay? So, some redefinition of uh, what I mean by okay. so I'll just introduce it because it will be useful but you can think of it just as some trivial change of coordinates instead of using gamma 1 2 I can use s it's some shift okay any question about this OK, now let's do some physics. So why, why is this Mellon transform good? Its nice properties mostly follow from the operator product expansion. 
In particular, I want to claim that the operator product expansion implies factorization of the Mellin amplitude. So now factorization is what Pedro was telling you that it was alike, is, is the fact that you will have poles and the residues are the product of lower point amplitudes. Okay? It, is, it, it seems to be a lie when you have massless particles around because of this physical phenomena of soft emission, but when you have uh, massive particles, which is the best analogy here, it's just true, right? He also was explaining that the poles in the asymmetric corresponds to bound state, so in that context, it's just true. Okay, so let's, let's try to, to understand that. So what's the best way to do this? Yeah, that's the example there, very good. So let's look at the simplest example, which makes it uh, pretty clear. So let's take O1. Yes, let's think like this. Yes, O1 at x1 and O2 at x2. And let's take that OP, so at point x2. So, so I'll write, um, so there will be a sum over all primaries, maybe some label Q for primaries. And then there's an OP coefficient, C1, 2, Q, the dependence x1, 2, <coughs> square, to the power delta Q minus delta 1 minus delta 2, everything over 2. And then you have the operator, the new primary, OQ at point x2. And this guy comes together with this descendant. And I'll write just one descendant that will be useful for me x12 square del square of oq at x2 and there is many more okay so this is descendants okay so now let's try to see what this means for the Mellin amplitude and actually yeah this example will be will be good so Can you see here? No, maybe not. I'll do it here. So what does the OPE tell you? The OPE is, a, is an operator statement, right? It's valid inside any correlation function. So it tells you that in any correlation function, the singularity, like the behavior of the correlator when x12 goes to 0, is, is controlled by these powers. It's a power. It power-like, and the power is controlled by the dimensions of the operators that appear in the OPE. Okay. So how can we get that from this kind of integral representation of the correlation function? Okay. So from the Mellin amplitude, we get that this O1 <coughs> of x1, O2 of x2 with whatever is there, is what? It's given by... So we're taking the limit x1, 2 square going to 0. So let's focus on that. So you have uh, x1, 2 square to minus gamma 1, 2. Right? That's the only factor you get. Remember, sorry, maybe I should remind you. So this is x1, xi minus xj square when you go to the Poincaré path, so the physical rd. And you have this integral d gamma 1, 2 over 2 pi i times all the rest, all the other d gammas and lots of stuff in the Mellon representation. But basically, the dependence in x12 is just that, nothing else. Okay? So what is the only way you can get uh, um, a pure power behavior as predicted from the OP? You have to have a pull. And you have to have a simple pool, right? So, so, so in particular, uh, the Mellin amplitude that was here, right? So M must have simple pool. At so let's let's do it. Gamma one two equals what? 
delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta q over 2, right? But now, that's why I kept this guy here. Actually, for each primary, you have more powers, okay? So there is x12 square. So this guy increases. So in fact, must have simple pool, sorry, minus 2m, yes, where m runs from 0, 1, 2, all the way up to infinity. So each primary operator, okay? So the statement is each primary operator, so for example, let's do the four point function. If you have 1, 2 going to some operator q, 3, 4, so for each primary operator OQ that is being exchanged in this OPE, you will have a pull at this position. Actually, you'll have a semi infinite sequence of pulls at precisely this position. Okay? And uh, the f if you assume the CFT as a discrete spectrum, okay, so if you have a discrete spectrum of operator dimensions, then uh, this implies that the male in amplitude is meromorphic. It only has it only has simple pulls. Okay? You see, if you have a double pull, you'll start to get logs. So that's well, you can see that in perturbation theory when you start expanding in all the dimensions, but as a non perturbative statement, melanum should only have simple pull. What else should I say? Ah, and of course, I didn't emphasize it, but it's clear also that uh, the residue of this pull is just controlled by the OP coefficients, right? Because you not just have to fix to get the right power, you have to get the right coefficient. So the residue of this pull is controlled by the product of the OPs. Uh, here and here, okay? So let me write the... Um, <coughs> the summary of this uh, result. So, so more generally... So let's, let's look at the... More generally, but still the four-point function. Because here, my argument was simpler because I was just looking at scalar operators. But you can generalize the argument for any operator that is being exchanged in the OPE. Yes? I'm not sure it takes the, the black hole, right? Well, it's just words, so that's... <laughs> M of S and T. So this should have poles, okay? So this sign... This sign means it has a pole in this position with this residue, okay? Just means that. S minus, so the position of the pole is delta Q minus LQ plus 2M. So again, I'm saying, I'm doing this case where the operators 1, 2, 3, 4 are exchanging an operator with dimension delta Q and LQ, okay? And... Um, Okay, and again, M runs from 0 to 1 to infinity. So, so the important thing to learn is that you get the twist. If you just do the scalar, you might think that the position of the pole is the dimension. It's actually dimension minus spin. Okay? And then here in the numerator, as I said, is controlled by the product of the OP coefficients. But if the operator has spin, then actually, so this function is a function of two variables. I'm using now this S and T parameterization. So at the pole, you can still have a function of the other variable, T. And what happens is actually what you get here in the numerator is a polynomial of degree given by the spin of the operator, which actually also depends on this little m. But these polynomials, which I will call Mach polynomials because they were first computed by Mach in 2009, nine? Yes. When, he, when he introduced this Melvin representation, uh, are completely kinematical, okay? So they are, they just follow from the tensor 
the conformal uh, symmetry of this OPE. Okay, so if you like now do the OPE with a operator with spin, you get some tensor structures, and when you contract them, you get some some tensor structure that then when it goes here into the melin, you you can trade that by a specific polynomial. Okay, so this is completely kinematical. There's no dynamics. The dynamics is in the C's and in the dimensions, as usual in a CFT. Yes, it's related to the conformal block. So it's a degree L degree equal to the spin of the operator. Okay? It's related to the conformal block, so in particular, in particular, if you take this Melin representation, okay, and now you just uh, instead of computing the full integral, you just pick up the poles, this entire sequence of poles from m equals zero up to infinity, and just sum those poles. That's the conformal block. Okay? So the contribution just from the poles is the conformal block. Very good. Uh, ah, so here the analogy with scattering amplitude should again be uh, more more obvious now, right? Because now you really have an on-shell pull related to the mass of the particle. Remember that my momenta satisfied some kind of on-shell condition where the mass square was this dimension. You should actually think that it's the twist that was for scalars. And so here I'm just seeing that when the internal so the momenta, if I think here I have momenta k1 and here k2, then here I'll have k1 plus k2. And so when k1 plus k2 square is equal to this uh, internal particle uh, mass, if you want mass square, you'll have a pole. And moreover, the residue scales as t, the end of mass, to the spin, okay? which is also what you see when you have a scattering particle, uh, a scattering amplitude when you exchange a particle of spin L. Okay? This would be, in scattering amplitude, this would be like the, the Legendre polynomial okay, of the scattering angle. Any question about this? Sure. So, so this is a descendant. So, so suppose I have my primary. Um, and now I just act with del square to the m. That increases the dimension, but does not increase the spin, and increases the dimension by 2. So increase the twist by 2m. You mean the external particles having spin? Uh, I would expect something similar, but that's precisely open question. It's not. It's not completely... I'll, I'll mention a bit of external spin, but uh, not the general case is not, is not understood yet. You can ask again. Okay, maybe, maybe some systematic erasing is necessary now. Ah. <laughs> OK, we can postpone that. OK, so what do I want to say? Ah, I want to say an ex I want to mention an extension uh, of this result for four-point functions that, uh, that we found last year with uh, Emilio and, uh, and Vasco Gonçalves, which is when you analyze factorization at the level of endpoint functions, OK? So let's look at an endpoint Mellin amplitude. So, so I'll, I'll put here O1 of P1. Okay, it's still external scalars, but uh, it's many of them. OK of PK, OK plus 1 of PK plus 1, whatever, you see up to O n, okay, and I have an endpoint Mellin amplitude, suppose I have that. So now I can also ask, uh, what is the contribution? Do I, do I know anything about this Mellin amplitude 
if I analyze the multiple OPE of all of these external operators, okay? So I can also consider all of these first K operators inside some sphere in radial quantization and write the entire multiple OPE. And so that should give me also some factorization channel from this point of view. And so that's precisely what we find. We find that um, if you do this, then the, the endpoint Mellin amplitude has a pole. So I'll write uh, this variable gamma LR delta Q is the same thing, internal delta. And the residue factorizes into M left, where you have the 1 to K, and here you have the operator OQ times the operator OQ M right K plus 1 up to N. So what is this variable gamma Okay, so now this is complicated, right? Now it's an endpoint function, so it's not just two variables, there's a huge number of variables, this n, n minus 3 over 2. So what is this variable that is particularly sensitive to this pole, to this factorization channel? Can you guess? Sum of? some of the dimensions, some of the k's, exactly. So it's just the momenta that is flowing like the graph suggests. So you sum ki's, well, now I, that's the problem of changing to k. i from 1 to k, okay? Please don't confuse number of particles with momenta. S squared. Okay? So, so it's ex exactly the analog. So, so this momenta now, I think I, I'm allowed to, to introduce them because they really help you find the positions of the poles of the Mellin variable. You just impose this momentum conservation and, uh, and, and the natural on-shell condition that you would associate with this operator OK. So in this case, I'm doing a scalar operator immediately gives you the position of the pole and the residue factorizes as it should. Very good. So this is the simple formula. Then there are the more complicated formulas. So more generally, but OK, that I will not write explicitly. But more generally, as you say, this thing will have, first of all, it's the twist when you do generic spin. And as you say, it's a sequence of poles, not just one with some residues. Let me say Q, or whatever, I already used Q. So let me say residue uh, M, OK? So the point is that I'm giving you here the explicit formula of the residue for uh, M equals 0 and spin 0. So for higher M, the residue is always just a function of the same data. So if you know this lower point Mellin amplitudes, you know the residue, but it's not just a product, OK? You have to make some shifts and multiply by some gamma functions. So it becomes a bit more messy, the formula. But you can write an explicit formula for the residue in terms just of these two elementary objects. The case with spin is more interesting, because now, if I have spin here in the middle, now this Mellin amplitude has an external leg with spin. And that I have not defined. So let's do it. Questions? So one one thing you you can see now you see so one uh, 
this, this factorization properties. So if you want to compute an endpoint correlation function, it's a very complicated object. Now we, we have the hope of trying to understand this object as built from simpler objects just by using this, uh, these properties as a, so it's a, it's a metamorphic function and uh, the poles and residues are controlled by lower point Mellin amplitude. So you can even imagine there is some uh, recursion relation that you can write down. But okay, this is at the general level of the CFT. Then I will try to show you, maybe I should keep that. I will try to show you that in ADS, if you compute written diagrams, then really this is the simplest possible form of writing correlation functions that come from written diagrams. So if you just write them in position space, you get some special functions with some, well, complicated, mysterious properties. Well, you can try to study them, but they're not transparent at all. If you write it in Merlin space, very simple functions. In particular, like even, even complicated written diagrams can be just constants or polynomials in this language. Sorry? The residues are? Sorry. I'm no, th they are. They are they are lower point Mellin amplitudes. Yes, they are on shell. Everything is. Yes, exactly. They are really on shell data. It's, it's like it's like in scattering amplitudes. The the pole is a product of two on shell uh, correlation functions. It's just that it's the higher poles. They are still just a function of on-shell data, but they are not directly the product. It's like you just have to multiply by some factors, do some shift, but it's the same information. You don't have to compute any, any on-shell information. More questions? So actually, I forgot to say something which is very important. And I hope there's still enough formulas to understand that. So what about uh, the gamma functions? Nobody complained about the gamma functions yet. Why not? So first one comment. <coughs> the nice factorization formula I wrote only works if I put the gamma functions. Otherwise, I get some extra factors. It's not just like the, the product of lower point Mellin amplitudes. So the gamma functions help you to have nice factorization properties. But they have poles, right? So if you actually do this integral, the gamma functions contribute with uh, uh, terms like the OP. They already have poles, so you'll get some powers of x12 square. Okay? But, but the gamma functions have poles at some fixed position. So you look here, you see gamma12. So in this case, you have double poles because I chose this particular combination. Otherwise, it would always be simple poles. But uh, you see the poles are at the position gamma12 equals 0. Gamma12 equals minus 1. And if you map that to s and t variables, so the gamma functions, so poles of gamma of gamma one two correspond basically they correspond to operators which have dimension delta q equals delta one plus delta two plus L Q plus two M. So what is this? Anyone remembers this formula? It's double trace. Okay. So what happens is that 
the poles of the gamma functions automatically incorporate the OPE contributions from multi-trace operators. Okay. Exactly. So if you, are see, if you are writing a planar correlation function okay, in the planar limit, then this is really perfect because you only have contributions. So the melin, so, so the, let me write that. So planar, planar correlators mean that the melin amplitude only has poles associated with single trace operators. So that's why Witten diagrams become so simple in Malin space, because most of the OPE structure inside Witten diagrams is multi-trace uh, contributions. So, so for planar correlators, this really is a very nice property. Of course, in general, it's not a nice property, because you don't expect to have operators precisely with this dimension in generic CFT. So generically, what happens is that if you define it like that, then Melin will just have zeros that will cancel these poles. Okay? So that's um, so in that case, you maybe it's reasonable to say that you should not incorporate, define it with this gamma function. You should just define M as the full object. But still, the factorization properties still look nice if you define it like that. So it's really an open question. So for example, if you compute the Mellon amplitude for the four-point function of, say, the, the, the sigma field in the 2D Ising model, you get some nice formula. And what it is, it's three gamma functions divided by these six gamma functions. So they, this, they just cancel. Okay? So, so they are not there. So OK, that's just a comment I wanted to make. No, they, for example, the property that uh, the residue in a four-point function, the residue is a polynomial of degree L in the variable T, will not be true. You will have some one over gamma of T, some shift, something like that. Just that. And it's true, and it provides a factor. I'm just saying the formula looks nice with the gamma. Phi. If you don't like it, it's OK. You can define a different Malin amplitude. Yes, it just looks less like it. Um, when you have uh, corrections, no, no, so even it's what I say here. So if you're computing a planar correlator, so even in planar correlator, sometimes you have, uh, it already includes, you can compute corrections, uh, 1 over n squared corrections to the, n, to the dimension of double trace operators. And, and that, that is OK. So, so the statement is really this one. So if you have a planar correlator, so a three-level diagram in ADS, then it will only have poles, the melin will only have poles associated with single trace. But in that diagram, you can, uh, from that diagram, you can extract, for example, the leading 1 over n square anomalous dimensions of double trace operators, for example. OK. Let me then, uh, so the good thing about talking Mali, about Mellin amplitudes here is that you already know almost all the technology needed. So, so what's a vector? So let's let's consider a correlation function of n scalars and one vector operator. Okay, that's something like a would appear there when, that I erased, but I will explain again. Okay, so let's try to guess. No, so it's actually there. So there is for a scalar. So what can we put here? Okay, now we have this this vector index. So we have to come up with a representation similar 
to the one for scalars, but now that is compatible with this index structure. Well, you have to use one of these vectors, and you should not use p, right? Because that's redundant. So let me just write p a of any one of these points a, and I will sum a from 1 to n. Okay? And now each one of these vectors, I can multiply basically by a scalar Mellin amplitude. That would be like the first obvious thing to do. So I'll just integrate the gamma. So there will be a Mellin amplitude with an index A, one for each particle. And then I'll have this product, um, Pij to the gamma Ij. But now, so there's one point which is special here, right? So I'm treating it as a special point. So, so I'm separating it. So here I'll have that part, minus 2 p dot p i, gamma of something. OK, so what should I put there in the exponent? OK, so actually, I think I will just put here gamma i. And I will define it what it is. But if I do it like that, it's not homogeneous. This, uh, because here I have weight 1 already in the point A. So I should here add delta i A. Okay? That just means that uh, now the constraints will be all the same independent of A, because the extra weight I, I put here in this vector, I cancelled with this delta function. So there's an extra p dot pi there. OK. So, so we have to play the same game again. So what is the constraints on, this, on these variables? What are the constraints? Let's look at pi. So what's the weight at pi? It should be delta i. And what is there? It's sum of gamma ij. Uh, j from 1 to n, j different from i, plus gamma i. That's what I mean. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's what I mean. Plus delta i. A, right? And um, Ah, sorry, no. You should correct me, right? It's wrong, because I already have weight here, so that cancels the delta function. OK, so this is weight at point pi. Point pi gives this. Do you agree? Delta i is the dimension of the operator oy, the standard. Right? So. What I'm saying is that in this, in this case, since I have a special point, these variables gamma i can be immediately just solved in terms of the gamma ij's. Okay? So that's, that's what this constraint is telling you. But now you also have to satisfy the other constraint on the point p. So this, this point here, which the weight I'll just call delta, the dimension of this operator I'll call dimension delta. And what, what do we get on this side? We just get this total sum, right? So we get sum of gamma i, i from 1 to n, plus 1. <coughs> OK, and in fact, so, so the, what I want to do is I want to use this, so solve for gamma i as a function of gamma ij. And then uh, the only constraint you have to impose is when you put them together. And let's see. So you just have to sum. And basically, it's sum of gamma ij i and j from 1 to n. I think you get uh, uh, delta minus 1 or 1 minus. Is it delta minus 1? 1 minus delta. Okay, 
This is actually, we should not be doing this actually. So the most important point is what goes next. So any question about this? So the point is that it's easy to try this. It's the obvious generalization. There is some constraints on these integration variables. But the main difference is that now, instead of having one Mellin amplitude, you have n because there is this tensor structure, so there is n of them. Okay. Because that was redundant. Remember, when you project to the physical space. But there was also a constraint, if you remember. So there was a constraint that vector operators in the embedding had to obey had to be transverse in some sense. So I no, I've not imposed that constraint, but it's easy to impose them. If you act here with P, you will just get P dot PA, and that just will, will simply cancel this delta function. And basically, um, right, it will, it's important, sorry. It cancels this delta function, and so you get the right weight without the delta function, <coughs> but now, to bring everything to the same form, you need to uh, remove the plus one from the gamma function in the numerator, and then you have an homogeneous constraint for the sum of the MAs. So the constraint you get is that actually the sum from A from 1 to N of gamma A times MA has to be zero, okay? Because you have to put everything together and you get a sum. So the, the me it, it becomes a scalar Mellin amplitude once you contract with PA. And so if you want the full correlator to be zero, the full scalar Mellin amplitude must be zero. But to put everything together, you get this equation. OK, so with this definition, should I give you something more? So what time is it? No, I should not give you anything, any more details. Very good. So, so with this definition, you get exactly the, the right result. So you, you get a, a nice generalization. So we go back to this picture where you have a scalar Mellin amplitude from 1 to k, k plus 1 up to n. You have some scalar Mellin amplitude. And now, if there is a scalar operator being exchanged uh, in the OPE, you have a pole at gamma LR equals delta minus 1, where delta is the dimension of the operator that is being exchanged. And the residue, so you have this lower point Mellin amplitudes, ML, but now with one leg, so they have an A, right? Because they are vector Mellin amplitudes. So here you have the operator OA from 1 to k, times, again, another three-point Mellin amplitude, m right b, here of the operator, where, oh, where is and, uh, and uh, so the residue is given by this sum over a and b from 1 to n, and here you just put gamma a b. Okay, so now, you should think of this as like the sum over elicities that uh, Freddy was writing, right? Now you have a vector operator, so you have to sum over the several possibilities. So here, the best thing, uh, the best uh, formula we could find was with this definition, you introduce this set of Mellin amplitudes, and then the residue is given by that. But okay, the most important fact is that again, the residue is completely determined by on-shell data of lower point correlation functions. Okay. Of course, formulas are not as simple as scattering amplitudes, but that it's a fact of life. Okay, I will not say anything else about this. Any question? So let me make some quick remarks then about what happens when you do ADS-CFT. So, so suppose, suppose then let's compute the simplest diagrams. 
So let's compute Witten diagrams, which are just contact Witten diagrams. Okay, some endpoint contact Witten diagram. Okay, so this this means endpoint one, two, up to n. So I gave you the bulk to boundary propagator. You can write the product of bulk to boundary propagators, integrate over this point x in ADS, right? Dx in ADS. And uh, that gives you a correlation function. You can write it in the Melbourne presentation. And what do you get? Any, any guesses? Sorry? Just a coupling. You just get a constant. OK, so if you, there is a coupling constant there, you can put it here. OK, so that's it. It's the simplest possible Mellin amplitude corresponds precisely to contact diagrams in ADS. Okay? So this is, well, if you think about scattering amplitudes, that's just what you expect. Right? A contact scattering amplitude is just, is just a coupling. Right? If, yeah. So, so you, should, you already see that Mellin amplitudes are some kind of amputated. Right? It's really like a scattering amplitude. The, the bulk to boundary propagate don't contribute anything. But then you can continue. So you can start playing with, OK, um, even here, maybe here I can also. So here, what happens if, uh, if instead of taking, so this case was an interaction. So I was doing an interaction like uh, phi 1, phi 2, up to phi n, right? So some simple vertex is just a product of scalar fields, OK? So now suppose I take a slightly more general contact interaction where I put derivatives, OK? So I take uh, phi 1 and then some covariant derivatives contracted, phi, sorry, phi 2 and then some covariant derivatives phi n, OK? And I contract this covariant derivative some way, I don't know, mu, mu, whatever, some scalar vertex with decorated with derivatives. So what, what do I get for the Mellin amplitude? So now you go scattering amplitude. Huh? Yeah. If you do scattering amps, what would you get? Polynomials, exactly. So you just get a polynomial uh, and actually the, the degree is basically the number of derivatives, okay? Or then, yeah, the number of derivatives divided by two. So polynomial, yeah, okay, I don't need to write. So good, we're very happy. Let's continue. So what happens if I start doing uh, I don't have space to write the formula I want. What happens if I start doing uh, exchange diagrams? So let me try this one just to illustrate the features instead of writing. So the point is that we can actually write Feynman rules for at least for these scalar diagrams, scalar tree level diagrams in ADS. We can actually write Feynman rules. So let me let me just illustrate how that works here for this uh, for this diagram. So so the Mellin amplitude. So for this diagram, what would you write for the Mellin amplitude? So what should I say? Yeah, let's say this is particle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. OK. So um, and here, these internal propagators, I put some dimension delta. And this one, for example, some dimension delta bar. OK. OK, so what, what would you write? Well, if you're doing flat space, you know what you would write, right? It's You have to write. Uh, um, each vertex, there's some contribution from the vertex and some contribution from the propagators. Okay, so so let's just write uh, the propagators here first. So the propagator here, what propagator should it be? Well, you have momentum k1 here, k2 here coming in. I'm all momenta are incoming. So here your momenta k1 plus k2. So this propagator should at least have a denominator, which is k1 plus k2 square with this mass, okay, plus delta. 
But of course, we know that propagators in ADS are not just one pole. They are a sequence of poles. So you have to put here plus 2m. And there's some numerator that I will not write explicitly. Some gamma function that depends on delta and m. But that's your propagator factor. Okay? Of course, at the end, at the end, you will have to sum over this m from 0 to infinity. All the poles contribute. Okay, of course, you have another similar propagator, which maybe I can write here. K4 plus K5 square plus delta bar plus 2 M bar S delta bar M bar, for example. M bar equals here. Okay. So what about the vertices? The vertices also depend on, so depend on the legs that come, that join there, the dimensions of the legs. And they also depend on this internal quantum number, right? So there's an M that goes together and an M bar that goes together, okay? So there's some vertex that uh, depends on uh, delta M, delta bar, M bar. And what's the other leg? The other leg is delta 3, delta 3, but it's a bulk to boundary propagator. It's not a bulk to bulk, this one. So M is 0. That's the only rule. So, for example, the other one is just uh, delta 1, 0, delta 2, 0, and delta m. Delta m. Okay? And I guess you get the picture, no? V. Well, I will not write. So, these two functions, so this function, these two functions are explicit functions. So, they actually, this vertex, the... It was Miguel Paulos that compute them uh, completely explicitly. And uh, they're just explicit functions. This one is a bit complicated. It's some special function of these labels. But that's it. The, all the dependence on the Malin variables, which is really the non-trivial dependence, is explicit here in the propagators. In particular, you see that really the only poles are associated with the internal propagators. Okay? So, I mean, to compute this diagram as integrals in ADS in position space is really beyond the present technology. Well, you look, you can write some integral, but it doesn't tell you anything. Any question? Exactly. Well. No, I shouldn't say exactly. They are very suggestive of that. There's what is momenta in the bulk? I, usually when I give this talk, people ask me, but this momenta live in what space? There are vectors in what space? Here nobody asks me. You guys are sleeping. I don't know why. <laughs> and I always have to say, I don't know. It's true. I never introduced any space for this momenta. This is really an auxiliary thing. In all formulas, I have inner products. If you look at this formula, well, it's natural, and another formula that I would like to write, I don't know if I have time, it's natural that this momenta live in d plus one dimension, right? like the dimension of the bulk. But the bulk is curved, so it's not like there's no natural definition of momenta. So. There's some sort of like flat space limit. Right, that, that was the other formula I wanted to write. How much time do I have? Uh, minus one minute. The boss is distracted, so I can continue. No, I'm not saying that. Uh, no, 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 no. It has everything to do. It's the same Malina. So, so let's, let's let's go through the logic. So you have a conformal correlation function, object. You can compute whatever you want. You have this conformal correlation function. You can write it in this form, and you have a Malin amplitude. It's equivalence. It's like Fourier transform. Okay. Now I'm talking about a particular class of correlation functions, which is correlation functions that you compute by doing this Witten diagram in ADS. Okay. So to a given Witten diagram, there's an associated correlation function, which is given by this integral. Okay. And I'm saying that for these particular correlation functions, the Malin amplitude is simple. It's like either this or what I was saying there. 
Is it clear? Now you want to connection to conformal blocks. Okay, now a given correlation function can be expanded in conformal blocks. Okay. For example, this correlation function, let's let's say four point, uh, otherwise it becomes mess. Let's go slowly. This correlation function, what's the expansion in conformal blocks? Not this one, the one with four. This one. What conformal blocks appear in the expansion of this written line? No. There are infinite number of conformal blocks associated with the double trace operators of the external operator. Okay. So each written diagram um, contains an infinite set of conformal blocks. So there, this one is richer. So besides all this infinite family of conformal blocks of the multitrace, it also contains conformal blocks associated with the exchange operators, with the operator dual to the exchange field. Okay? So, yeah. so this written diagram is different from this conformal block. No, even don't have to talk about Mellon amplitude. So here, if you exchange the operator. O, and here you have the dual, so phi is the dual of the operator O. This written diagram gives you a correlation function, which is different from this conformal block. So to have an equality, you have to have this plus infinite sums over double trace operators. Okay? Any other question? Yeah, I didn't explain. I didn't explain. This was a statement without explanation. Yeah, uh, then why did you write this M equal to something? I just, yeah, I don't have time to explain. So actually, the way we derived this, no, actually, okay. The way we derived this was, was mostly brute force. What is the statement? The statement is that if you compute this diagram in ADS, with the usual rules of integrating over vertices, bulk to bound to propagate all of that, you get some correlator. Then you write it in that form, and the melon turns out to be this. Okay. So we, in the beginning, we did all of these brute force exercises to get this form. Then we understood that there was a simple pattern, that there were some Feynman rules that you could write directly the answer. Okay. But you see, it's actually natural from what I told you, because most of the complication inside this diagram comes from double trace, multi-trace contributions. So since I already argue that the only poles in the Mellinam to are sim simple trace, sorry, single trace operators, then you only know that you already know that you should only have this type of poles that I wrote here explicitly. Should not have any other poles. Okay? Then okay, to get these precise factors you have to go well you could even use factorization to get also these precise factors. So in a way you can also yeah you can derive these rules using factorization. This V, yeah, of course, this V is proportional to the bulk coupling. Here, I'm just saying that it's it's not just a constant. It, it depends on this integer and the, and the dimension. Sorry? Can you speak louder? Sorry, I can. Ah, right. If there are derivative couplings, yeah, there's some generalization of this. Right, you will probably, yeah, you will get uh, also uh, dependence in the numerator because you are taking derivatives, um, yeah. Mm, 
No, but it's not exact. So for example, I guess that will follow from the, no, I can say that that's actually the way I derived the formula I want to write. So for example, you look at this polynomial. So, so you look, you write a specific vertex, and then you compute the scattering amplitude in flat space using that vertex, and you also compute this Mellin amplitude in ADS using that vertex, okay? Given, given some vertex with derivatives, phi 1, derivatives phi 2, up to phi n, you can compute some scattering amplitudes, let's say t of the, of the Mandel's time invariance, let's say the momenta in flat space uh, ki dot kj, okay? So you get some polynomial, right, on these variables. Using this, basically you just have to contract. Actually, it's, you just have to know how many contractions are between this and this, right? Let's say I have n, uh, one, two contractions. Then I'll have here ki contracted with kj to the n i j, right? Product over all uh, i, well, let's say less than j. Basically, that's it, right? Given in flat space, computing the scattering amplitude associated with such a vertex, you just transform derivatives into momenta. That's what you are saying. So now, let's see what happens. So this is uh, flat flat. <laughs> and this is ABS. So let's see what happens to the melin, which is now a function of gamma ij. What happens is that you get precisely the same factor, gamma ij to the nij, plus subleading. By subleading, I mean uh, terms which don't, so the maximal power here is, uh, Right, n is equal to sum of nij, so this is like gamma to the n minus one, things like that, okay. order gamma to the n minus one. Okay, so so it's not true that you can just replace derivatives by momenta, but the leading order term of the polynomial indeed is exactly the same as in flat space. There is ah yeah, actually there's some function here that depends on n. If you put here some coupling constant g, like here g, you get g, but now there's some function that depends on the number of derivatives. That's why the formula I'm going to write right now, I really have to write it. Um, it's not as simple as it should. So, should I write it or should it? It's distracted, very good. So, so all right. <laughs> okay. So what is this formula? This formula is for the following. Let's take. Uh, it's precisely this this experiment. This uh, this experiment that I was describing. There. Let's take. Uh, let's take flat space. So let me just draw like some kind of diamond diamond to describe flat space. And let's take some Witten diagram here. Sorry, some F Feynman diagram here. And you describe some uh, scattering here. So there's some scattering amplitude T of this momenta. K i, OK, it's, it's a function of Mandelstam invariance, k i dot k j, like, like I was describing there. So in particular, it could be a contact interaction. Okay? And now let's draw exactly the same Feynman diagram in ADS. So it becomes a Witten diagram. So the only thing that changes is that you integrate over ADS and the external legs, instead of being plane waves, are bulk to boundary propagators. Okay? Just that. So here you have a Mellin amplitude. <coughs> so what you can do is to write a formula that relates the Mellin amplitude you have here, which is now a function of the gamma ij variable, uh, with this scattering amplitude. And so I'll just write the formula and then we can discuss or discuss in the afternoon. So you take your gamma ij and what do you do? Well, it's already coming from that uh, expression. You want to match leading terms, so you want to take gamma ij to be very large. So the natural thing is to write ki dot kj 
Um, and then this is dimensionless, so you have to multiply by r square. And so, of course, the limit has to be a limit when r uh, goes to infinity, right? Because you want to go from a curved space time with radius of curvature r to flat space time, so the radius should go to infinity. And so this is giving you what you want. But to get a precise formula, you have to actually introduce some auxiliary vary alpha, and there's some integral you have to do over alpha. Alpha to some number. It's sum of dimensions, I think. D minus sum of dimensions over 2. Yes, OK. There's some constant. I don't, you don't need to know about this constant. That's it. OK, so actually, it was good that you asked me this question, because what, what this formula does is basically apply to this specific case. You see, you already get the leading order term. So if it's polynomial, the limit r goes to infinity just picks the leading order term in the polynomial. So that integral just creates this function that depends on the number of derivatives, such that you can apply the same formula to whatever vertex without having to know a priori with the number of derivatives. So that formula just does this game of going from here to here for all possible contact interactions. That's what she was tailored to do. She was created to do that. That's what this integral does. Okay? And, uh, and okay, now the argument is that this is a true formula. Because, you see, this is a complete basis. Any interaction, if you expand with arbitrary number of derivatives, you can write any possible interaction in this, in this form. And, well, in particular, you can also test this in many examples. You can test this formula by computing other diagrams, exchange diagrams like I was drawing there, and you check that it also works. And actually, there's a, there's a, very, uh, a different kind of derivation of this formula by Jared Kaplan and Liam Fitzpatrick, which really what they do is to really construct scattering inside into the sitter space but scattering of wave packets, so they prepare wave packets coming in from the boundary, such that they only scatter in a small region inside ADS, much smaller than the radius of curvature. Okay? So by doing that, they can really extract the flat space S matrix by this wave packet construction, and they get to the same formula. Okay? So this is another indication that this gamma ij are really something like the bulk moment, the inner product of bulk momenta, but okay, that's the concrete formula you can write. Sorry for going over time. Thank you. Yeah, we should probably go for lunch and continue at two with the discussion. So far, uh, we didn't, couldn't make any progress in that direction. So we tried a bit, but it's not clear. It's not clear. It looks good, yeah, right? Because you know all this additional information. Yeah. But, um, yeah, convergence. I think there's a problem with convergence. The OPE, the bootstrap, works very well because the OPE is very fast.